If you're watching this on YouTube, you might have noticed that this episode is a week delayed. But if you want to get early access to our episodes, consider becoming a paying member. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with your friends. Thank you for all your support. My name's Paula Kirby, and for the next half hour or so, it's going to be my great pleasure to be interviewing Richard Dawkins. Richard, of course, needs no introduction from me whatsoever. His, um, his background, his experience, and his views are very well known. So much so, in fact, that for the next half hour or so, we're going to be taking a bit of a walk on the wild side and exploring areas that, that don't normally get covered in interviews with Richard. We're going to be speculating about some of the possible origins of life on Earth. And the key word there is speculating. Um, we're not, I don't think Richard's going to be suggesting that the ideas we're going to be that we're going to be discussing are in any way gospel. <laughs> Richard, let's start with Little Green Men. There was a lot of excitement recently in the Expelled movie when Ben Stein shrieked with delight and glee that Richard Dawkins doesn't believe in God, but he believes in Little Green Men, and how crazy is that? Tell us about your love affair with Little Green Men. <laughs> let's go back in history a little bit. Um, in America, <laughs> you can't teach creationism, or indeed religion, in science classes. And so the creationists had to give up on that. They lost a court case, and they reinvented themselves as intelligent design. And one of the chief um, prophets of intelligent design is a man called Dembski. And he went out of his way to say that the intelligent designer, oh, of course it's not God. Oh, no, nobody would ever dream of violating the Constitution and suggesting it was God. The, the intelligent designer could be an alien from outer space, for all he knew. Now, of course, that's what he says to um, the public media, but when he's talking to um, uh, parishioners in churches and so on, it's very different. It is, of course, the God of the Old and New Testaments. However, the public stance of the intelligent design people is that the intelligent design, uh, the intelligent designer, might as well be an alien from outer space. So when Ben Stein, who was the compare of the infamous Expelled film that some of you may have heard of, asked me in interview whether I could think of any circumstances in which uh, I could remotely think that intelligent design of life on Earth was plausible. I raised the possibility, as I thought, extending an olive branch <laughs> to the intelligent design people that maybe an alien from outer space might have designed life on this planet. That was enough for Mr. Ben Stein. <laughs> Dawkins believes in little green men, but he doesn't believe in God. And uh, this has been held against me uh, ever since. But I, I do think it's an interesting uh, possibility to discuss that there might be life on other planets elsewhere in the universe. Well, indeed. And I think um, something that fascinates me is the thought of just how similar that life might be if it existed, but also perhaps how different that life might be. I'm wondering how reasonable it is to extrapolate from what we know about science on Earth and assume that those laws and principles apply or would apply elsewhere in the universe as well. Yes. Uh, science fiction writers are often criticized for making their life forms too similar to our own. Uh, when I was seven, I wrote a science fiction story called Bobo Goes to the Moon, uh, and it was about a little was dog. Was it published? Well, unfortunately, it wasn't published. Uh, it was about a little dog who went to the, to the moon. And even at the age of seven, I had the sense to realize that it was too much to hope that the inhabitants of the moon would speak English. <laughs> so I made them speak French instead. <laughs> It is, a, it is a tussle in science fiction because the human imagination is somewhat limited and so inevitably you tend to get roughly humanoid uh, creatures, perhaps with rather swollen heads or perhaps an extra eye in the middle of their forehead or, or, or something of that sort. But there's rather little imagination of really, really, really alien life forms. But actually as a scientist I think it's a very interesting question what, how different they might actually be. For example, all life on this planet is based upon polynucleotides, usually DNA, and sometimes its cousin, RNA. Um, is that a universal? If we think about life on other planets, does it have to be based on DNA? My, my guess to that is not. On the other hand, I do think there's got to be something like DNA. There's got to be some equivalent 
to a genetic molecule, maybe not even a molecule, but something equivalent to genetics, which is going to be extremely high fidelity. It's going to have a comparable high fidelity to our own computer systems. That means it'll probably be digital. It doesn't mean it'll be DNA. DNA is digital, but it'll probably be digital. Um, another thing that's characteristic of life on this planet is protein. And that's not an accident. Proteins have this extraordinary quality that the linear sequence of the building blocks of proteins, the amino acids, the linear sequence of amino acids along a protein molecule determines the three-dimensional shape into which a protein molecule will coil itself. Protein molecules spontaneously coil themselves into a very, very particular shape. And that particular shape is different for different linear strings of amino acids. And the linear strings of amino acids are absolutely determined by the genetic code. And what that means is that genetic code determines the three-dimensional structure of a protein molecule. And the three-dimensional structure of a protein molecule determines its enzymatic properties, determines the chemical reactions that it will catalyze, and that in turn, through the immensely complicated cascade of events in embryology, determines the body that develops in the womb or in the egg. So something like a protein molecule has, I think, got to be characteristic of life on any planet where there's life. It doesn't necessarily have to be protein, but what I would ask of a, of a chemist would be, can you think of any other class of molecule that has that property of folding itself up into a uniquely characteristic enzyme of which there is an enormous repertoire capable of catalyzing an enormous repertoire of chemical reactions, and this is in itself to be absolutely determined by a digital code. That, I think, pretty much has to be characteristic of life elsewhere, but the details of what the bodies look like is almost certainly going to be very alien indeed. OK, um, so I think what you're saying, life elsewhere would have had to follow the same sort of principles as life here, but it could actually be quite, quite different. Different in detail, yes. I think there have been speculation about perhaps ammonia being the basis of life in other parts of the well, universe. Well, that's interesting, yes. I mean, the, the, the possibility that it might not be organic at all, yes. say, not, might not be based on, on, on carbon, that's another interesting speculation. Is carbon the only element in the periodic table that's capable of forming the right kind of chains um, to provide a sufficiently large repertoire mm -hmm. um, of, of specifiable chemicals? And, and um, perhaps silicon seems to be the only other, other possibility that's ever, ever been um, been suggested. Ammonia has been suggested as a possible alternative to, to water. One of, the, one of the characteristics of life as we know it is that it's based on water. And in fact, the people who call themselves exobiologists, who scan the heavens with their spectroscopes, spectroscopic telescopes, um, for the possibilities of life, what they're actually scanning for is water. They can't actually mm -hmm. scan for life. Uh, but, but it's sort of become a sort of rule of thumb among exobiologists that water is what you need. That's, it doesn't prove there's life, of course, but, it, but it's a necessary condition for life. That, even that might not be true. But even if that's not true, I think I'm right in saying that some sort of digital code, coding for some sort of specifiable phenotypes, probably via protein, is necessary. OK. So in some shape or form, it is possible to conceive of life elsewhere in the universe perhaps following similar principles, but nevertheless quite different when it comes to the, the realization of them. So I'm kind of intrigued now because in your books, particularly The God Delusion, you're absolutely adamant that if there were such a thing as a God, it would absolutely have had to have evolved. It couldn't oh, simply okay. have always yeah. been there. It would have had to have evolved. And yet you seem to be saying now that actually it is possible to conceive that elsewhere in the universe, different scientific laws might apply. Aren't you simply taking a law that, that is accepted for life on Earth and trying to apply it beyond Earth and even beyond the universe. Yes, this is a fascinating question. The, the extent to which what we, what we can speculate about elsewhere in the universe where we have absolutely no idea what's going on, how much we can say on sort of purely logical grounds has got to be true. And I think that the point about um, compl complexity having to have evolved is not just a point of observation on this planet. It's not, not just a matter of observed fact. 
that all the complexity we see on this planet has evolved by gradual degrees. I think it's a matter of logic that complex things, by their very definition, are improbable things, statistically improbable things. And statistically improbable things don't just happen. Statistically improbable things have to come about through an orderly, comprehensible process. Evolution by natural selection is, I think, the only such process ultimately that we know that's capable of doing that. So I wouldn't like to say that evolution by natural selection has got to be going on on any planet in the universe where there is life. But something equivalent to it has got to be going on, such that simplicity builds up into complexity by a comprehensible process. You cannot just say, oh, complexity just happened. You can say uh, maybe hydrogen just happened because hydrogen is relatively simple. But what you can't say is something complicated enough to, shall we say, design the laws of physics or design life or design a bird's wing. Something complicated enough to think that out is the, is the very kind of thing which is not just going to happen spontaneously. And when you think about it, creationists use exactly that argument themselves when they say something as complicated as an eye or a bacterial flagellum couldn't just happen by chance. Well, of course it couldn't. That's why we need natural selection. And by the same token, exactly, God couldn't just happen. Okay. It's an interesting idea that I think I've encountered somewhere in your works that you, you pose the idea, and I, th I feel the need to issue that health warning again, that this, this is not something that you're claiming as true. You might like to just confirm that in your answer. Um, that it's possible that elsewhere in the universe, beings could have evolved to such an extent that they might even appear godlike to us if, if we were ever to encounter yeah, them. Yes, I mean, when, when, when I say I don't believe in God, somebody might say to me, well, how do you know there's not some superlatively complicated and intelligent godlike being um, orbiting Alpha Centauri? Uh, who would be so obviously godlike that were we ever to meet this character or the, those characters, we would fall on our knees and worship them. And I think that's perfectly plausible. I think, if you think about it, um, if, if we could fly in a Boeing 747 to, uh, uh, to the Middle Ages or to the Dark Ages and suddenly land by the side of an Anglo-Saxon village, I mean, they would undoubtedly think we were gods and they'd fall down and worship us. By the same token, um, that I bet there are somewhere in the universe, because the universe is so large, I bet that somewhere in the universe there are beings even more advanced relative to us than we are advanced relative to a Dark Age Anglo-Saxon peasant. And so we probably would fall on our knees and worship <coughs> them. But they would not be gods in the sense of things that have just happened spontaneously. They themselves would have had to have come into existence via either evolution or something like evolution, which has the same property of building up complexity step by step through slow, gradual degrees from primordial simplicity. They've had a long time to do it. It's only taken life on this planet about three and a half to four billion years to evolve to our level of technology. There's about 14 billion years in the universe as a whole to play with. And so there's been plenty of time for superior technologies to develop. They might well be godlike, but they would not be gods in the sense that they would not have been there from the start. They would have come about through slow, gradual degrees. Intelligence, creativity, design, complexity, these are things that all come late into the universe. They cannot exist right from the start. And could alien advanced beings of that kind possibly have created life on Earth? Well, uh, this is a speculation that um, actually the great Francis Crick um, mentioned, I think somewhat tongue-in-cheek. Uh, at the end of one of his books, uh, he talked about an idea that he and his colleague Leslie Orgel had had called directed panspermia. And the idea is that uh, bacterial life on Earth was seeded in the nose cone of a rocket that was sent from some distant planet, uh, perhaps by a, an alien civilization that uh, didn't wish its form of life to go extinct and therefore wished to propagate its form of life, which according to the speculation was a DNA protein-based form of life. So this alien civilization stuffed the nose cone of a rocket with, with bacteria 
and launched it into space. It crash landed on Earth and started life, he, life here. Now, Crick and, and Orgel, uh, I, I think, were, were speculating in a sort of tongue-in-cheek way. They were acknowledging that the origin of life on this planet is a very difficult problem that hasn't been solved. Leslie Orgel himself uh, is one of the leading workers on that, on that topic. And it just seemed reasonable to them to, to, to be open to the possibility that life might have originated elsewhere. But even that speculation, of course, doesn't absolve us from the responsibility to think of a way in which life could have originated somewhere in the universe. It just gives rather more time. It gives us 14 billion years rather than only 4 billion years uh, <laughs> in, in, for, for that to happen. Actually, it's not 4 billion because, of course, life originated sometime before we see the first bacterial fossils, which is about 3.5 billion years. And the Earth itself is only 4.6 billion years old. But you're not suggesting, are you, that that actually is how No, I don't believe that for a moment. I mean, I think, I think life did originate on, on this planet. Uh, and um, it, we have a responsibility to try to think out how. But um, I, I don't think we need to resort to such an outlandish hypothesis as directed panspermia. But it's up to us, to all scientists, to be open-minded. But nevertheless, it is, it is a really hard concept, I think, for, for those of us who are not scientists, to get our heads around. As far as we know, the Earth is the only planet in the whole universe, as far as we know, that actually has intelligent life on it, or any kind of life that, that we're sure of. And the chances of that happening seem to be so infinitesimal. Why should that be? Don't you, can you at least understand why people who are prone to a theistic interpretation of life might say, well, look, isn't that just too amazing to have just happened by chance? Doesn't that sort of indicate that there's a God who wanted it and created us, created Earth with a moon in the right place and with Jupiter in the yeah. right place and yes. with a friendly sun and a friendly solar system and all the rest of it? Yes. Um, well, th there's no doubt that, that our situation on this planet is uh, comparatively <laughs> friendly. I, I don't wish to concede uh, at, at all that, that, I don't, uh, that there is only one life form in the universe. I think it's probable that there is uh, quite a lot of life in the universe. Um, I think it's probably a very rare phenomenon, which means that uh, any one of these little islands of life is probably rather unlikely to encounter any other of these islands mm -hmm. of, of, of life. So it may be that all islands of life are blissfully unaware of each other's existence. Um, it's a genuinely open question how rare life is. Now, let's go to one extreme and entertain the possibility that this is indeed the only planet in the entire universe where there is life. And then we have to say, well, um, what, what can we deduce from that? Uh, one thing that Paul has just pointed out is that um, we can say that this planet has certain very friendly properties. It's exactly the right distance from a star, from its star. If it was, it's the so-called Goldilocks zone. Mm -hmm. If it was um, it's Goldilocks in the sense of just not too hot, not too cold, but just, just right. Um, uh, it's in the Goldilocks zone in the sense that, that if it were any closer to the sun, all the water would boil. And if it were any further from the sun, all the water would freeze. So there's quite a narrow band of orbits uh, in which the water remains liquid, which, which we need. Um, there's also the moon, which has a certain stabilizing effect, which makes, um, uh, which makes it possible for life to, or makes it easier, at least, for life to have evolved. There's Jupiter, which acts as a great big hoover uh, to stop too many um, asteroids and, uh, hitting us. Uh, quite, some do, nevertheless, but, but, it's, but it's rare. One of the reasons is that Jupiter's there acting as a great gravitational sink, uh, pulling these missiles um, away. So there is a lot going for us in this solar system. And so there damn well has to be, because we're here. I mean, obviously, ev if, even if we're the only form of life in the, in the universe, we would have to be that the one planet where we are would have to be a planet which has those favorable characteristics, however rare such a planet is. Now, knowing, we don't know, but calculating, speculating, well, more than speculating, um, it's an, an informed calculation about how many planets there are in the universe. There must be actually a very large number uh, which have at least those um, complacent properties uh, friendly to life. It may still be that only one of them uh, is actually has life, and um, that 
has a very interesting consequence, which I perhaps briefly Please, ex explore. Um, if anybody wishes to say that this is the only planet in the entire universe which has life, then a consequence of that would have to be that the origin of life the chemical circumstances that gave rise to the first self-replicating molecule, the first proto-gene, the origin of life would have to be a quite fantastically, stupendously rare and improbable event. Because if it were not stupendously rare and improbable, it would be in lots of other planets as well as this one. So if we, if we in theory, imagine a spectrum of possibilities where on the one hand, um, uh, that there's lots and lots of life all over the universe. On the other hand, there's only one. In other words, on this end, the origin of life is a fairly probable chemical event. On that end, it's a colossally improbable, a stupefyingly improbable event. Nevertheless, because there are so many planets, stupefyingly improbable actually means it only happens once in the universe. And with hindsight, this is the so-called anthropic principle, with hindsight, that one planet has got to be this one, because we are the ones talking about it. We are the ones sitting here thinking about it. And so the anthropic principle is a very elegant, beautiful idea, because it, it has this curious paradoxical effect that it allows us to entertain a, a hugely improbable event and still, and still come up with a satisfying, complete explanation for our own existence. And it's even possible to twist that argument further and say that because we've never actually been visited, as Enrico Fermi said, where are they? Because we've never been visited, you might deduce from that, or never even been visited by radio waves from a distant planet, you might deduce from that that intelligent life, at least technological life, is indeed very, very rare. And therefore, if it were easy for us to understand the origin of life, if chemists could come up and say, oh yeah, easy to see how, how, you could, how, how life could, could originate, it could originate in this way or this way or, th or this way, we should be positively worried because if it's easy to think of how the origin of life happened on this planet, then there should be lots of other planets where it happened as well. So the one, one corollary of the where are they question is that if there is life elsewhere in the universe, it, it, it's got to be non-technological life. Um, te technological life has got to be rare, which means that either the origin of life itself is very rare, or the origin of life is allowed to be common, but the origin of um, advanced, intelligent, technological life has got to be very rare. Somewhere along the line, you've got to interpose a sort of wall of improbability in order to explain why we have never been visited. But some of the ideas that scientists come up with in trying to explain the origin of the universe, the origin of life, they sound pretty wacky, don't they? And, and it's the sort of thing that, I mean, certainly the origin of the universe, it's hard to conceive of how there would ever be evidence to, to back some of those ideas up. And I know, for instance, in The God Delusion, you refer to the multiverse theory, for instance, and the idea that there are universes within universes within universes, and that perhaps it might be possible to think of, of a situation where we, we all existed in man, many different universes at the same time. And there's a line in The God Delusion which has been thrown back to you rather scornfully a few times about there are universes in which we are already dead and universes in which we have a green moustache. Yes. And this tends to get thrown back well, at you as if to say, yeah, well, okay, there's on, a, you there's can a believe that. There's a little bit of con God. confusion here. Um, there, are, there are two entirely phys physicists, and I'm not one, and there may be plenty of them here, I suspect there are. Um, physicists um, use this idea of many universes in two quite different ways. Um, the green moustache way is used by um, <coughs> quantum theorists of a certain kind who, you, you know, in, in quantum theory, there is extremely weird results. Uh, particles going through two slits at once and Schrodinger's cat uh, you know, either being dead or alive and, and neither until you open the box, that kind of thing. Um, now, there is one school of thought, the many universes school of thought, more, more, not so much school of thought, school of interpretation of what's going on in the quantum weird, weird experiments, which says there are many universes and in some of the universes, Schrodinger's cat is dead. In other universes, Schrodinger's cat is alive. And in yet other universes, Schrodinger's cat has 
shall we say, a green moustache. Um, so th this, is, this is a way of saying, the, um, of getting away from the, um, the, the weirdness or explaining and interpreting the weirdness of quantum experiments, which certainly work. And that's, I think, not what, one's, what is meant by a multiverse, mm -hmm. although it sounds superficially similar. The multiverse is the idea that there are lots of different universes with different laws and constants. And physicists do have reasons to postulate that, a reason to postulate the idea that there's a, a sort of foam, as they sometimes put it, of bubbles. And lots and lots of bubbles, and we're just in one bubble. Our entire universe, our entire visible universe, is just one bubble. And there are lots of other bubbles which are different universes with different laws and constants. And one of the uses of the multiverse theory, as opposed to the many worlds quantum theory, one of the uses of the multiverse theory is to account for the fact that not just this planet appears to be friendly to life, but this whole universe appears to be friendly to life. And this has been explored especially by Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal and um, President of the Royal Society, uh, in a book called Just Six Numbers, in which he draws attention to six constants, the fundamental constants of the universe, which physicists at present have no interpretation no, no understanding of why those numbers have the values that they have. They understand everything else once you've got those six numbers, but they don't understand those six numbers. So those six numbers are simply postulated. They just exist. And um, Martin Rees and others have calculated that if any one of those six numbers was just a bit different, then we wouldn't be here. The universe would hardly be here. It might be that there would be a universe, but everything would be hydrogen and helium. There'd be no other, other elements, or there'd be no stars. There'd just be a, a, a diffuse mass of, of say, hydrogen. Uh, lots of, uh, the, each one of those six constants, according to Martin Rees, has got to be just so. It, and so one could imagine a theist um, thinking of God with six knobs that he can twiddle, setting up the constants of the universe. And God started out by adjusting each of these six knobs to exactly the right value in order that the universe should last long enough to bring forth life, should have stars instead of just uniform matter, that the, um, that the constant um, governing the, uh, the, the strong and the weak forces and so on should, just, should be just right. Well, that's the theistic interpretation, which I think is fatally flawed by the argument I said earlier, that complexity can't just happen. The anthropic principle, which is often actually hijacked by religious people, but is in fact a profoundly atheistic argument. The anthropic principle says, there's a multiverse. There's this great foam of bubbles. And in most of these bubbles, the laws and constants of the universe are wrong. They, they're not, 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 not wrong. They're, they're, they're not right for life. They, in, in this bubble here, the universe, only, the universe fizzles out a picosecond after the Big Bang. In this one here, uh, it lasts long enough, but there are no stars. <coughs> but in this one here, out of the billions of universes in the multiverse, in this one here, the constants are just right. It's the Goldilocks principle, again, but at a cosmic level rather than just a planetary level. Now, you can see once again that the anthropic principle allows us with hindsight to say, if there is a multiverse of universes, if there is a foaming bubble of universes, then, and only one of those bubbles, or a few of them, are friendly to life, then by the anthropic principle, we have got to be in that tiny minority of bubbles, which is friendly to life. Otherwise, obviously, because we're here. If we were in one of the other bubbles, we wouldn't be, weird, we wouldn't be there. Nobody's thinking about this in another bubble. So um, I find that satisfying, so long, of course, as we're allowed to postulate a multiverse. And so it rather turns upon whether physicists have other good reasons to postulate a multiverse, and I think they have. Uh, it, it becomes a little less convincing if the only reason to postulate a multiverse is in order to invoke the anthropic mm. principle. But don't let's get, I mean, what, what, what Paul is referring to is that, is that at the event two days ago, when Christopher Hitchens was having a debate with a man called John Lennox. John Lennox talked about the, the multiverse and talked about green moustaches. Mm -hmm. He was actually confusing the multiverse theory with the many worlds interpretation of quantum theory. As a mathematician, he should know better. 
Uh, and he was throwing that out as an example of the absurd things religious um, um, atheists uh, believe in, um, uh, universes in which people have green moustaches. So would I be right in summarising you as thinking that, OK, some of the things that scientists are postulating are pretty weird and sound pretty strange. And superficially, you might say, well, if you can believe that, why can't you believe in a god? But are you saying that what the scientists are putting forward as possible suggestions, not, not claims of truth, but possible suggestions, are at least consistent with, with what science has I think I'd go today? further than, than that and say that, that history teaches us that, that um, science is weird, <laughs> that the that the things that, that modern scientists have discovered, re relativity, quantum theory, they are far more weird than any Grimm or Hans Andersen or, or, or Bible or anybody could possibly imagine. They are just plain weird. And so let nobody ever say scientists are complacent. They know everything. They've, they've got everything tied up. That's what scientists at the end of the 19th century rather did. The 20th century was an awful lesson in... in um, not doing that. So um, yes, science is going to be deeply, deeply mysterious. Um, I've forgotten what else. I, um, I was going to say something. Um, anyway, that'll do. <laughs> <laughs> OK, my final question to you is, is a bit of a challenge, really. Um, in The God Delusion, you consistently refer to two different possible explanations for various things, one being a crane one being a sky hook. And I have to say that for me, those, those, that terminology doesn't work terribly okay. well. I find the two actually quite confusing. Okay. To right. me, a crane, if I imagine a building crane, it feels terribly like a sky yes, hook Yes, that's me. a good point. Um, OK, the, the terminology is not mine. It, it's Dan Dennett, the philo philosopher Daniel Dennett. And uh, what he means by a sky hook is an explanation which is sort of like a great hand coming out of the sky and fiddling with things. And you're left without an explanation for where this great hand comes from. So God is a sky hook, fairies are sky hooks, spells, incantations, um, wizards and witches and warlocks and, and, and turning frogs into princes. Um, none of that has any kind of explanation. It's all, it's all done by sky hooks. And when a fairy tale allows you to wave, wave a magic wand and make things like that happen, that's a sky hook. God's a sky hook. Uh, OK, that's sky hooks. A crane is the opposite of a sky hook. A crane is an explanation which really does elevate. A crane really does explanatory work. Evolution by natural selection is the crane par excellence. Because evolution by natural selection starts with primordial simplicity and works up by slow and gradual, intelligible, understandable degrees to ever-increasing levels of complexity until you reach levels of complexity that couldn't conceivably happen by luck. Skyhooks are a kind of um, inadequate rationalization of luck. A crane is a true explanation which really does work up gradually. And I think Paula's problem is that if you think about a crane, there is a, there's a hook hanging down, down from yes, the sky. Exactly. And so that I think Dan Dennett's terminology from that point of view is, is unfortunate. So perhaps we should substitute, what do you think? Uh, what are those things that farmers have that, that, that um, um, a forklift, no, yeah, a, a, um, um, an elevator that where, you, where you toss hay onto a a sort of moving ramp. An, an escalator. Escalator yes, would be good. Escalator OK, we don't have skyhooks and cranes. We have skyhooks and escalators. Okay. And what we need is an escalator. Yes. Um, and natural selection is a, is a superb example of, of, an, of an escalator. And that, coming back to the really point that's been coming up throughout our, our, our discussion, the problem with God is that it's a skyhook. And the advantage of evolution by natural selection is that it's an escalator. Richard, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We're going to move to a period of questions and answers now. So if, if I could have the lights up so I can see the audience, that's fantastic. The gentleman at the back, just, right. just in the middle, about five rows, rows forward. Can I go? You can. <laughs> Professor Dawkins, um, can I just take up the, uh, the point about panspermia and, and Leslie Organ and uh, Francis Crick? Um, my understanding is that uh, spectroscopic studies have identified 
an awful lot of organic molecules out there in space. I'm not sure what I mean by that, but I hope you do. Um, <laughs> what, what conclusions, I mean, can we draw any conclusions from that, except there's some chemistry going on out there, or are these molecules residues of chemistry that's gone on somewhere else? I don't have a feel for what it actually might mean. I'm trying not to read anything into it. Y like yes, I, I, I think if, if you mean can we draw the conclusion that this is the, this is the residue of extinct life forms or something, I d unfortunately we can't do, do that. Yeah. I think what it means is that it's rather easier to make organic chemicals in the universe than perhaps had once been thought. And it had once been thought perhaps that, that even the making of organic chemistry on this planet was a rather rare event. Now from, from analysis of actually not, not just spectroscopic but also uh, meteorites, um, that there, there, there's a lot of organic chemistry about, or organic chemistry simply meaning the chemistry of carbon. So there, there's a lot of carbon chemistry, and that means that when we're talking about the primeval soup on this planet, which is which is a soup in which there are or in which there are postulated to be organic chemicals, that becomes an easy thing to postulate because there are organic chemicals all over the universe. It still remains difficult to postulate the origin of life, which is the origin of the first self-replicating. Uh, molecule, but at least we've got a lot of organic chemistry. So the the finding you're talking about um, makes it a, a, makes the problem a bit easier. Okay, thank you. And our second question over there, um, Professor Dawkins, may I draw you a little bit on your book, The God Delusion, which in many ways underpins <laughs> the discussion that you've been having this morning. Now, in the preface to the paperback edition of that book, you acknowledge that there are what you call sophisticated theologians like Bonhoeffer and Tillich, and you say you're going to leave them aside, you're not going to tackle their arguments, you're going to focus on the Jerry Falwells, the Tom Robertsons, the Ayatollah Khomeinis and the Bin Ladens instead. And you proceed to do what I think is a very witty and often splendid and important insight in demolishing these cultic aspects of religion. <laughs> Though of course you have predicated it by setting aside the sophisticated side. But can I put a personal point to you? That it seems to me that you then go on and create a kind of cult out of atheism itself. And your own website, richarddawkins.net, with its merchandising section in particular demonstrates this, where you've got the entire iconography of atheism on sale, including a choice of T-shirts and even two different <laughs> Richard Dawkins can car I, bumper stickers. Can I draw what you to a close? That? That's it. Richard, you started yes. a cult. Um, well, <laughs> OK. Um, first, I, 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 I hasten to say that the, that the merchandising is, is, is all in, in aid of, of the foundation. None of it goes to me. I mean, I, I, I need to, to, say, to say that. Um, the point about Tillich and Bonhoeffer and, uh, and um, attacking the easy targets like Jerry Falwell, I wish that all religious people were like Tillich and Bonhoeffer. I wouldn't have bothered to write the book if they were. Um, but unfortunately, the huge majority of religious people in the world, not just Christians, but Muslims and, and, and others as well, wouldn't have the faintest clue what Tillich and Bonhoeffer are talking about. What they like is the Bible or the Koran, whatever it is. They take it literally. Um, and it's no good saying, oh, that's not my kind of Christianity. Well, fine, it's not your kind of Christianity, but I didn't write the book for you. I wrote the book for the vast majority of religious people who naively believe in the Bible or the Quran or, or whatever it is. Now, I would genuinely like to have, probably not now, but there won't be time, but to have a conversation with uh, somebody who, is, who follows Tillich and Bonhoeffer to hear what they really, really do think. I would be interested in that, in that argument. I've never actually heard a sophisticated theologian say anything that I regarded as worth discussing, to be quite honest, but I'm, I'm re always ready to be disabused of that. Meanwhile, my hands are full dealing with the Jerry Falwells of this world, who are hugely influential, <laughs> hugely rich, and who have vast followings in the United States and elsewhere. OK, we're taking a question from the gentleman at the back there. Um, I'd like to hear your views on uh, ab the most abstract reaches of mathematics um, and why that tells us anything about the world. As far as I can see, um, maths pro probably uh, didn't need to be very sophisticated to, to allow us to evolve in terms of survival. It wasn't particularly attractive in the mating game, as far as I can tell from the abstract mathematicians that I know now. <laughs> um, 
But when Einstein went out into the most extraordinary reaches, which are purely internal in the brain, as far as I can tell, see, he came, the result came back to E equals mc squared, and he split the atom. Now, why should there be that connection there? That this is not in any way a pro-religious point. It's just something that fascinates me. Well, I think you're, there are two questions which you could be asking. What, I thought at first you were saying a question that Einstein himself, I think, asked, which was, why is the universe intelligible mathematically? And other people have asked that. What is it about um, mathematics that makes it um, the, the the, the explanation of the universe. But the other question, which I think you actually were asking, was what is the advantage to humans of having mathematical understanding? Why would natural selection, you pointed out that mathematicians don't seem to be particularly, I don't know why you say that, particularly <laughs> good at um, attracting mates. Um, uh, so, so what is the biological advantage of having a mathematical brain? Um, I share your puzzlement, but it's not just mathematics, it's also poetry, it's music, it's art, it's all kinds of things which clearly separate humans off from all other animals and seem to separate humans off from all at least naive interpretations of Darwinism. Now, my own rather lame attempt to understand this is to say that uh, something about natural selection gave us big brains. The big brains were originally useful for survival and for mating. and it was a byproduct, an unforeseeable byproduct, that the big brains also happened to be good at mathematics, poetry, music, etc. Um, an analogy which I do find fairly convincing is with a computer. Computers were originally designed as calculating machines, automated, programmable calculating machines. And once you've got an automated, programmable calculating machine, you suddenly find that whether you like it or not, you've also got a word processor, a chess playing ma machine, a, a, a simulating machine. You've got a versatile machine whose versatility wasn't originally planned, but which was inevitable in the manufacture of a calculating machine. I think the same is true of brains. Once you've got a, a brain that's become so big for good survival reasons, once it's been, got beyond, gone beyond a certain threshold of, of size for survival, then automatically it becomes capable of doing formal logic and mathematics and, and poetry. That may not seem a very satisfying explanation, but actually it does satisfy me. OK. We're going to go over there to the young man at the back. Um, I'm scanning the audience for a woman who'd like to ask a question afterwards. Um, so all men, hands down, please. <laughs> Yes, OK, the next question after that. Can we have the microphone of the young lady there? Thank you. Go ahead. Richard, um, thank you for a um, characteristically stimulating talk. And I'd also like to personally thank you for um, helping to disabuse me of my supernatural religious beliefs. Please send your story into Converts Corner <laughs> on richarddawkins.net. That's yeah. on the cult website. I read the website regularly. <laughs> um, and uh, raising my consciousness to the uh, splendor and wonder of scientific awe. Richard, I'm a trainee psychologist, and with regards to religion and mental health, the uh, um, evidence is uh, unambiguous. People who are religiously active tend to be um, psychologically healthier than people who aren't. Now, I'm not defending um, religion or arguing that God is true. My point is that if we as um, secularists and free thinkers wish to outcompete religion, if you like, um, then we need to follow um, the uh, the, the practice of religion, which is the sense of community that, that religion offers, and is probably the most significant reason as to um, its uh, psychologically um, healthier uh, reasons why people who are religiously active are uh, psychologically healthier. And so if we wish to advance as a movement, then we need to um, create that sense of community. Now, given that um, uh, uh, congregating free thinkers has been likened to uh, herding cats, do you agree with me, and how best do you think we can achieve this? Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, perhaps what we should do is, is start a cult, but which, 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 which I actually have not done. And in a way, um, what you're criticizing is the very fact that I haven't done it, and others like me haven't done it. We don't do cults. Um, now, if you're right that uh, religion predisposes to greater mental health, I would like to see the evidence for that. But as you rightly say, it doesn't for one moment suggest that religious belief is belief in anything true. Uh, it's, it could very well be that believing a certain kind of falsehood 
does indeed make you happier and, and um, healthier and all sorts of other things. There's no earthly reason why that shouldn't be the case. Of if, if anybody, for example, is afraid of dying, uh, then to be told by a priest that you're not going to die could well remove some of the stress from your mental life and make you feel mentally he healthier. But of course, that doesn't for one moment make it true. Um, okay, so that's that, that, that's that point. But what about this fostering of a sense of community? Mm. Let us shy away from all ideas of, of cult and of um, acolytes and bishops and movements and priesthoods and things like that. Is there something we can do to um, provide some of the sense of community that churches do provide? It's been suggested that one of the reasons why the United States of America is such a, a religious country is that um, it's a country of immigrants and churches did provide a sort of substitute for the extended family that um, immigrants who coming to a strange country feeling lonely and missing their, their support system of, a, of an extended family back in Europe or wherever it was could turn to the church instead. Well, I see no reason at all why um, clubs and societies of free-thinking people shouldn't provide the same structure of God, no, what a coffee mornings and, and <laughs> creches for children and, and things like that. I, mean, I don't know if you've ever been to any of these mega churches in, in, in America. I mean, they are an entire way of life. There's, there's cafes and restaurants and there's, there's um, basketball courts and, and there's um, places where uh, children can be kept entertained while they're or rather probably going to be indoctrinated while the parents are. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I would certainly hesitate to do, to do that, but there's no reason why um, groups of free-thinking people shouldn't get together like any other groups. Groups of ornithologists, groups of stamp collectors get together, so, so why not? Herding cats is a problem. Atheists do tend to be of rather independent mind, and so um, that's, that's where the herding cats uh, uh, problem comes from, but I still don't see why it shouldn't be done. I'm not the person to do it. I'm, I'm not um, that way inclined, uh, but um, I, I would be happy if others did. Okay, thank you. And the young lady over there, thank you. Hi, um, my question is really a matter of curiosity, and it's how do you think religion is actually going to evolve or continue in this country? Do you feel it's declining on a worldwide scale, or you know, at the same time it's also becoming stronger? What do you think the eventual outcome might be? It's very complicated if you look at the world as a whole, because it, in the United States, religion seems to be of increasing influence. In the um, Islamic world, it's certainly showing no sign of decline. Um, the Islamic world is coming visibly into our world, and so we are, we're getting an increasing Muslim presence in Britain and, and Europe, uh, which um, is, is something we can't lose sight of. Christianity does seem to be declining in Britain, although not in America. It's declining in Europe, though not in America. It's possible to see Europe as a sort of haven of civilization in between sort of pincer movement of Islam on the one side and, and America on the other, um, with invasions from both, both sides, um, demographic from the Islamic world and and mimetic from the, from the American um, world. Um, so if you asked about, about this country, uh, I, I see Christianity continuing to decline. It's not obvious to me that if, it, that if as Christianity declines, Islam increases, that that's a good thing. It seems to me to be a, a rather poor exchange. Um, but um, I, I'm not really in the business of forecasting sociological trends. I think we have time for one last question. Yes, if you take the gentleman standing next to you there. The God Squad very often accuse you of being dogmatically logical, as if they didn't really have to make sense themselves. I'm not, I'm not m making a point here on that. What I'm asking you is, aren't there from time to time problems with the secularist cause, which I number myself in as well, um, when we get rather dogmatical, and the, 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 the example that I'm going to give you is the, uh, the ban, the hijab ban on, uh, in French schools. But I think your last remark 
it, in a way, slightly brought me to it, because I do think that there is a, a, a demonization of Islam, which after all brought us uh, quite a de great degree of, his, of, 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 of scientific invention uh, during the Dark Ages. And uh, I think there's a danger there of, I, I, I'm, I'm really throwing up the possibility that secularists can be dogmatists Yes, th there, is that, there is that risk. Um, in the case of the hijab ban, I think um, what I would say about that is that uh, if, we're, if, the, if French schools decided to allow French um, um, girls to, to wear the hijab, then they should allow the girls to wear whatever they like. What, what we shouldn't have is a bending over backwards to give religious uh, people a free pass where others are not. So if there are um, people in uh, French schools who, who want to wear um, some other garment which is not part of the school uniform, if there is a, a school uniform and if, if, the, if the other girls are compelled to wear the school uniform, I do not think that religion is a good reason to allow people to escape from, from rules. By all means, abolish the rule and, and say the children can wear whatever, whatever they like. Or, or you could say, and as long as it's not, I don't know what, I mean, not mini skirts below, I would have many inches, um, um, you, could, you could do that. But I, I, I really do resent the assumption that, 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 that religion has a kind of privileged excuse not to obey rules, whether it's laws of the land or rules of a, of, of a school. They should obey rules just like anybody else. Religion is not a reason for exceptional treatment in the sight of the law or in the sight of, of any other sort of rules. I think that's probably a very good note to wind up the event on. Thank you very much indeed for coming along. Thank you for your questions. And of course, our guest today, Richard Dawkins, thank you very much indeed. If you enjoyed this episode, you can show some support by subscribing to the podcast, sharing it with your friends, and leaving a review.